Let's turn to the 10th chapter of John. And this chapter divides into two just about equal halves. The first 21 verses occur on the tail end of a story that began in chapter 9 where Jesus healed a man who was blind by putting mud in his eyes and telling him to go wash in the pool of Siloam. The man then had a confrontation with the religious leaders, the Pharisees, who were trying to get him to somehow change his story so as to make it easier for them to reject the thesis that Jesus is from God. And they didn't want to believe that Jesus is from God. One of the problems was that Jesus had done this on the Sabbath day, and uh, they were more committed to the Sabbath than they were committed to the truth, apparently, because they just had to, they just couldn't get past the idea that a man who seemed to be doing the works of God might do them in a way that they would interpret as a breach of the Sabbath law. Anyway, they kicked the man out of the synagogue. Jesus looked him up, brought the man to faith in himself, and apparently collected to himself another disciple thereby. And chapter 10 then opens just as a continuation of what, uh, how chapter 9 ended. Jesus is in a conversation, or has been, in the last verses of chapter 9, he was in a conversation with the Pharisees, and he begins chapter 10. 10 as a monologue beginning with his characteristic verily verily I say unto you the translation we're looking at the New King James says most assuredly I say to you in the Hebrew or the Aramaic that Jesus spoke it was almost certainly amen amen which was a way of uh, getting someone's attention and saying this is uh, a, a certainty this is a truth worth paying attention to and believing Jesus frequently said it amen amen the King James Version translates, verily, verily. Uh, modern translations do whatever they wish with it. In this case, it's most assuredly I say to you. And, and with this, amen, amen, Jesus begins what is actually a monologue and shifts from the dialogue of the previous chapter. In those first 21 verses, he has introduced the idea that he is the good shepherd and that he is the door to the sheepfold. There's kind of a small parable within a larger parable. This isn't really, strictly speaking, a parable, but it's like a parable. Um, when I say it's not really a, a typical parable, Jesus, when he told parables, told about a certain man, or a certain woman, or a certain somebody. His parables usually weren't, I am something. That's more really what we call a metaphor than a parable. I am the good shepherd, I am the door. But the point is, there's a smaller metaphor, about Jesus being the door that is encased within or, the, or encompassed within the metaphor of I am the good shepherd. And he, he's drawing a contrast between himself and the religious leaders who had just kicked this blind man out of the synagogue. They were not good shepherds. They were in fact more like thieves and robbers because they, they sought to be leaders. They sought to gain control over the sheep, but they didn't come through the door, which Jesus identified as himself. Anyone who would really be a leader of God's sheep must come through Jesus because Jesus is the chief shepherd, as Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 5. He said, the elders who are among you I exhort, who am also an elder and also a witness of the sufferings of Christ and a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed, shepherd the flock of God, which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a willing mind. And he says, and then when the chief shepherd shall appear, when the chief shepherd, Jesus comes, you'll be rewarded, he says. Jesus is the chief shepherd, and anyone who wishes to shepherd God's people must come through Jesus, must be appointed by Jesus. And the Pharisees obviously were doing everything they could to avoid including Jesus in their program, and therefore they were not true shepherds. They had no true access to the sheep. They were like thieves and robbers that try to get at the sheep without going through the true shepherd. They were also like hirelings, and he, he brought that up too. He said there's a difference between a true shepherd and a hireling. The hireling takes care of the sheep for a fee, but he doesn't really care about the sheep. 
He just cares about his fee. He cares about his wages. If the job really becomes dangerous, if he sees a wolf coming, for example, rather than go out and risk his life to save the sheep, he'll run away because it's just not worth it. He's just in it for the money. He's not serving out of love for the sheep. He's serving out of love for himself, and therefore he's got to look out for himself. When danger comes, he runs away. But the good shepherd, Jesus said, gives his life for the sheep. The good shepherd puts himself in harm's way, and he says, I am the good shepherd. I am laying down my life for the sheep. He said, I have the power and the authority to lay it down. I have the authority to take it up again. And he said, I have other sheep too that you don't know about. He means, of course, the Gentiles. His disciples were all Jewish and did not know that there would be Gentiles who would be in the flock. They knew well enough from the Old Testament that Israel was called God's flock and that God was called the shepherd. By the way, when Jesus said, I am the good shepherd, it was tantamount to saying, I'm God, because the Old Testament identified Yahweh as the good shepherd. Psalm 23, 1, David said, Yahweh is my shepherd, I shall not want. And in Ezekiel 34 and Ezekiel 37, Yahweh had said, I will shepherd my people, I will shepherd my flock, I will gather them, and so forth. In Isaiah chapter 41, it says, he shall lead his flock like a shepherd. He shall gather the lambs in his arms and carry them in his bosom and shall gently lead those who are without young. This is Yahweh is talking about. In the Old Testament, Israel was God's flock and God was the shepherd. And Jesus says, I'm the shepherd. And I'm here to call my flock, my sheep. And he said, my sheep will know my voice. This is the case with sheep. Uh, it's possible, and many have observed this, that many shepherds could put their flocks in the same fold at night. But the sheep actually respond to their own shepherd's voice. In fact, uh, some shepherds have said that their sheep even recognize their own names when called. And Jesus said, my sheep know my voice. They don't know the voice of strangers. They know my voice, the good shepherd, and they follow me. And so what he's saying is he has come to Israel, which is the big fold. And he says, I'm calling my sheep out, and they're hearing me, and they're coming. This man who was born blind, as soon as Jesus appeared to him, the man responded completely submissive. He actually lay prostrate before Jesus and said, Lord. He called Jesus his Lord. He became a disciple. Whereas the other shepherds, the Pharisees, were totally contrary. They were opposed to Jesus. This man was part of the remnant of Israel. They were the true sheep that Jesus had come to call. And the true remnant recognized the Messiah when he came. They recognized the voice of the shepherd and they came out. And Jesus said, I have other sheep too in verse 16. I've got to go get them as well. They're not of this fold. They're not part of Israel. They're Gentiles. And he says, I'll bring them also. And then there will be one flock and one shepherd. The Gentile sheep and the Jewish sheep, there are in both categories. In the Jews, there are some who are remnant, whose hearts are toward God. They are the remnant, and they will come when he calls. Among Gentiles, there are also some who are already his sheep. There were already Gentiles whose hearts were soft toward God. He said, I'm going to go find them and bring them in too. You know, when Paul was in Corinth, and he was opposed there by... Uh, those in the synagogue, Jesus actually appeared to him in a vision and said, don't worry, Paul, I have many people in this city. Well, there weren't many converts yet. He had just gotten there, and he was the first Christian to arrive there. And Jesus said, don't worry, Paul, I have many people in this city. Well, who, who were they? They weren't Christians. Not yet. They were Gentiles. Gentiles who had never heard the gospel in all likelihood were unfamiliar with the law of Moses. And Jesus knew them to be his sheep. I have many people in this city. Don't worry. And, of course, Paul found them. Paul preached there for 18 months and drew, Jesus drew those sheep too. And brought them in along with the remnant of Israel to become one fold. And there being one shepherd. So this is what Jesus said up through verse 21. But we come to new material at verse 22, and this is exactly the halfway point of the chapter, but it's two months or so later than the previous. Uh, the last we knew, it was the Feast of Tabernacles. 
in chapter 7. And the Feast of Tabernacles is in September or October. When we come to verse 22, it's now the Feast of Dedication. We know that feast better by the name Hanukkah. And that, as we know, is in late December. We, I think we're all familiar with the fact that the Jews celebrate Hanukkah right around the same time that Christians have traditionally celebrated Christmas. And so that's the, this is the festival. It's called the Feast of Dedication. It was a relatively new ceremony when Jesus was there because it celebrated something that had happened less than two centuries earlier. In 167 B.C., the temple had been desecrated by Antiochus Epiphanes, the serial Greco uh, ruler who oppressed Israel, and he sacrificed a pig on an altar to Zeus in the temple in Jerusalem. The Jews saw that as a desecration of the temple that made it unusable until such a time as they could get the oppressors out and rededicate the temple and cleanse it from that uh, impurity. And so for three years, the temple was out of use. No sacrifices were offered in the temple for three years until, three, uh, until 164 B.C. Now, during that time, there was a war, a guerrilla war, staged by one family initially, an old priest named Mattathias and his four or five sons. And, and they uh, had like-minded people that went with them. They went up in the woods and conducted raids upon the Syrian oppressors for three years until they'd actually driven the Syrians out. And once this, the oppressors were gone, the Jews were able again to rededicate the temple, which they did. And uh, none of this is recorded in Scripture. This is all recorded in, uh, like, the first book of Maccabees and uh, Josephus and other historians. But as I understand the story, and uh, it, it may be that Michael here, who happens to have been raised Jewish, might be able to correct me if I'm wrong, as I understand, when, they, when it came time to rededicate the temple, it was going to be an eight-day ceremony, but they didn't have enough oil for, that, for the lamps to burn that long. They, they had a shortage of the special oil that they needed. And it was going to take, I think, eight days to get the full supply. And the oil in the lamps miraculously continued to burn and did not extinguish uh, for eight days. And therefore, they call it the Festival of Lights. Today, the Jews light candles or lamps for eight days in celebration of the rededication of the temple or Hanukkah. Is that essentially right? Yeah. Okay, good. They had oil enough for one day. Oh, they had enough for one day, and yet it lasted for eight. eight right. So uh, a little bit like the story of uh, Elijah and the woman who had enough food, a little bit of flour, a little bit of oil, enough to feed her and her son for one day, but instead because she dedicated it to the Lord and gave it to the prophet Elijah, God caused there to be more oil and more uh, flour there every day for three and a half years, supernaturally. So a similar story is told with reference to the rededication of the temple in 164 B.C., and that is Hanukkah. So it's obviously only a short time before Jesus' own lifetime. And the Jews, therefore, had been celebrating it much shorter period of time than, say, something like Passover, which was 1,400 years before the time of Christ. Passover, Pentecost, Tabernacles, these were very ancient feasts to the Jews. But Hanukkah was relatively recent at the time here. Now, was Jesus celebrating Hanukkah? He may have been. We find that he's in Jerusalem again. It was not mandatory for the Jews to go to Jerusalem for Hanukkah. The law did dictate that they come to Jerusalem for the Feast of Passover and Pentecost and Tabernacles, but Hanukkah... I assume was, uh, you know, it was not mandatory. But Jesus was there in Jerusalem again, now in late December. And it, it says it was winter. It doesn't say it was late December. It says the Feast of Dedication. It was winter. We know that it was late December. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Now Solomon's porch was a portico, a covered portico. Possibly he was there because it was bad weather. It was winter time, And it was in a covered area in the temple precincts. It was on the eastern side of the outer court of the temple, near the entrance to the temple. And it was also the location in the book of Acts, we read, that the apostles sometimes met there and uh, evangelized there. In the book of Acts, it was in Solomon's portico or Solomon's porch. Jesus, at this time, was walking there, and the Jews surrounded him and said to him, 
How long do you keep us in doubt? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. Now, this is one of the things that many people don't understand if they don't look at the Gospels carefully, is that Jesus did not go around proclaiming himself to be the Christ, not plainly. Lots of people think that Jesus might have been, of course, people who are not Christians, might have been a pretender to be the Messiah. When you bring up the fact that Jesus fulfilled so many prophecies of the Old Testament that pertain to the Messiah, their response is, well, you know, he knew the scriptures. He knew what the prophets had said. He just kind of played his cards right and did the things that the Messiah was supposedly predicted to do so that people would believe he was the Messiah. Any shrewd Jew who is familiar with the scriptures well enough could have done the same. Well, maybe, if, if in some cases, if that person really was trying to convince people he was the Messiah. Obviously, some of the scriptures that Jesus fulfilled were the things that a man doesn't have the choice whether he does them or not, like where he's born. Men don't, have the, 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 don't make the decision where they will be born or what year they'll be born or what tribe they'll be born. All those things, of course, he fulfilled those things without any possibility of engineering that. But some of the things he could have manipulated, certainly riding into Jerusalem on a donkey uh, to fulfill Zechariah 9, that, any man could do that, I suppose. The point is, though, that is presupposing that this man wanted to convince people he was the Messiah, and therefore he artificially fulfilled these prophecies so that people would think he was the Messiah. Yet Jesus in his ministry did not conduct himself like somebody who wanted to convince people he was the Messiah. For one thing, he didn't do the things and didn't even attempt to do the things that the Jews thought the Messiah was supposed to do. There were false messiahs, plenty of them. But they always did the things that the Jews wanted the Messiah to do, namely stage a revolt against Rome. Jesus never attempted to do that. And when they tried to get him to do that, he would not cooperate. He did not make any effort to convince anybody that he was the Messiah. In fact, he had never publicly said, I am the Messiah. As far as we know, there are only three times in Jesus' recorded mystery where he ever mentioned that he was Messiah. Two of those were in private settings. One to the woman at the well, when no one but she and he were there. Once at Caesarea Philippi, when no one was there but his disciples, and it was they that said he was the Messiah, and he confirmed it. God, bless her to you, Simon Barjona, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you but my father. And the third time when he was put under oath, on the Sanhedrin and asked, are you the Messiah? And because he was put under oath in the name of God, he honored the name of his father and answered. He had been silent up to that point. And so forced to speak, he confessed it was true. He is the Messiah. Now these are not situations that, are, uh, that look like a man is trying to convince the world he's the Messiah. He's very reticent to speak of it in those terms. And of course he could say to the woman at the well, I who speaks to you am he, the Messiah, and it wouldn't cause a problem because she saw the Messiah as one who would come and expound on religious matters. But the Jews in Judea thought the Messiah would come as a political leader. It would be much more volatile for Jesus to tell the Jews in Judea that he was the Messiah. It would get them, you know, starting to organize themselves as a militia to back him up. So he never had in Jerusalem ever plainly said, I'm the Messiah. Now, he said things that they could have taken that way, easy enough. Even I am the good shepherd of the sheep, which he said earlier in this chapter, could be understood to be a messianic claim. But he didn't use the term Messiah, and so they said, well, why, you know, how long are you going to keep us in suspense? If you're the Messiah, tell us plainly. And again, he speaks evasively to them. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you do not believe. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. In other words, he's saying to them the same thing he said to John the Baptist when John the Baptist was in, pri in prison. And John also thought that Jesus was not behaving very messianically, like he wasn't doing what John himself thought the Messiah would do. And he sent messengers from prison to Jesus. And he said, are you the one who's to come, or do we look for another? And Jesus didn't answer him directly either. He said to the messengers, you go tell John what you see. What do you see? The blind have their sight restored. The lame are walking. 
the, the poor have the gospel preached to them. All of these things were things alluded to in Isaiah 35 and Isaiah 61 that the Messiah would do. But Jesus didn't say, yes, tell John I'm the Messiah. He said, tell him what you see. Tell him the works I'm doing. Let him make up his own mind about that. And that's what he's saying to these people. Make up your own mind. Let the works I do speak for themselves. You, you, you put it two and two together. You're not going to hear me claiming to be the Messiah, but you can look at what I'm doing and reach some kind of a conclusion about that. Because the works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. Notice that Jesus did the works in his Father's name. That's helpful to us to know because we're told that we are to act in Jesus' name. Often we think of in Jesus' name meaning that we tag the words in Jesus' name on at the end of our prayers or at the end of our attempts at exorcism or our uh, whatever we do. You know, it says in Colossians 3.17, whatever you do and whatever you do, do all in the name of Jesus. So what's it mean to act, to do anything in the name of Jesus? Well, many times, especially when it comes to praying in the name of Jesus, we just assume it means you say whatever prayer you're going to pray and then just say in the name of Jesus, and then you pray it in Jesus' name. But that's not what it means. It doesn't have anything to do with tagging that phrase at the end of your prayer or anything else you're doing. It, to act in the name of Jesus means you act on his authority, and you act with power of attorney as his agent. You're acting in his name. You're acting in his place. You're authorized by him to do the things that he wants done. And therefore, you as his agent, with the power of attorney, you are able to go in as his agent. You're, you're a part of his body. You're his hands and his feet. You're his flesh and his bones. You are Christ on the earth. He has feet and hands on the earth still. And we are them. And we, we do the work of Christ in his name, that is, as his agents. And that's what he means when he says, the works I do in my Father's name. He doesn't say, I'm going around saying, be healed in the name of my Father. I pray in the name of my Father. Come out of them, you demons, in the name of my Father. He didn't ever give that, use that formula. But he, was, he said he was doing everything in his Father's name. That means he was authorized by his Father to do it. And he was doing the works of his Father. He was his Father's agent. He was in the, there in the place of his father, acting in his father's interest, just like, just like an attorney would act in your interest, as you've authorized him to do. That's what it means to act in another's name. We act in Jesus' name. Jesus acted in his father's name. By the way, just a couple chapters later in chapter 13 and verse 20. In John 13, 20, Jesus said, Most assuredly I say to you, or verily, verily, or... Amen, amen, I say to you. He who receives whomever I send receives me. And he who receives me receives him who sent me. That is, I am sent as the agent of one whom you are receiving when you receive me. I am sending you as my agents. And so those who receive you are receiving me because I'm authorizing you. You cannot refuse or neglect somebody's authorized agent without refusing and neglecting that person who authorized them. The authorized agent is the one, is an extension of the one who sent him. And Jesus said, I, I've been sent by my Father, and anyone who receives me is receiving my Father. I'm sending you, and anyone who receives you who I send receives me. So that's the same thing as we are acting in his name, he was acting in his Father's name, and he says, the works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. Verse 26, but you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. As I said to you, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. Now, he's back on this sheep thing. That's the last thing he was talking about uh, in the earlier part of this chapter, which happened months earlier. So he's, he may have been gone and come back, but he is at least revisiting this topic of him being the shepherd and them and his sheep being present and recognizing him as the good shepherd. But these people who were opposed him didn't, uh, they were not his sheep, and therefore they do not believe. Now, if you're familiar with the arguments of those uh, who are of Calvinistic persuasion, you know that John chapter 10, this particular segment, 
is very popular in their in their uh, arsenal of uh, proof texts. They have not only this verse, but some of the verses that follow as the proof of some of their points. Uh, one of their points being that of total depravity. That is, a person cannot believe in Jesus unless they are elect. And then they can only believe in Jesus because he has elected to regenerate them, bring them from death to life so that they are now alive and can now repent and believe. If he does not regenerate them first, they cannot repent or believe. And he will only regenerate those that he has formerly elected. And so Jesus says here, you do not believe because you're not of my sheep. And so it is argued by some that he's saying, you see, a person can't believe in Christ unless they're one of the elect. My sheep means one of those that I have foreordained to be saved from the foundation of the world. And since I didn't foreordain you from the foundation of the world to be saved, you are incapable of believing. Well, it seems to me like his words are intended to make them feel ashamed. I don't see how they'd be ashamed if he said, well, you can't believe in me because I didn't choose you before the foundation of the world, before you were born. I mean, that might make me sad to hear, but it wouldn't make me feel ashamed. I wouldn't feel like I had anything to do with it. It hardly puts any guilt on me. If I can't believe for the simple reason that God chose that I shouldn't believe, well, let him take the responsibility then for my not believing. It doesn't, I can't see any way that it lands on me. But if he's saying, I have sheep here in Israel who are the faithful remnant. They are my sheep not because they were predestined before the world began to be my sheep, but they are my sheep because they have earlier in their lives made decisions to be faithful to God. And now, since they've been faithful to God, God has given them to me to be my sheep. And those who have already been part of the faithful remnant of Israel are my sheep. You are not. You are not my sheep. You, have not, you are not part of the faithful remnant. You have not in your earlier life made decisions to be faithful to God. You have taken a different course. You have hardened your heart against God. And that's why you can't believe in me, because I'm not the first time. My words are not the first exposure you've had to God. You've been exposed to Moses and the prophets. You've been exposed to the word of God from your childhood. And you have, at some point in your time, hardened yourself against that. Your eyes you have closed. Your ears you have stopped. That's what, how Jesus described the people who were not his disciples when he gave parables. Remember when, he, when his disciples said, why do you speak to the people in parables? He said, well, because hearing they may hear and not hear perceive and seeing they may see and not understand or whatever he said he said in Matthew 13 their ears they have stopped and their eyes they have closed lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and be converted and be healed they have stopped their ears and their eyes earlier therefore he's not giving them any more light he's concealing his message from them because they have already chosen sides before this when Jesus came Israel already had within it a faithful remnant who had chosen to be faithful to God and those in Israel who had chosen to be rebellious against God. And it is those who were hypocrites and rebellious that he came to denounce. They were not his sheep. Not necessarily because of anything that happened before the foundation of the world. I mean, it may be. It is, you know, it's not impossible that he could have predestined them before the foundation of the world, but this passage wouldn't necessarily prove that. It doesn't say anything about that. Therefore, it cannot be used as a proof text for such a point as that. You'd have to get that somewhere else. All he's saying here is, you people don't believe me because you are not people who are my sheep. Well, who are my sheep? People who listen to me and follow me. You're not doing that. If you don't listen to me and follow me, then you can't believe me. He says... In verse 27, my sheep hear my voice, I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life. And they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father, who has given them to me, is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Now that statement, I and my Father are one, we'll have to talk more about, but in the context, he's clearly saying that my hand and the Father's hand are the same hand. He says, no one can take them out of my hand. 
My father is greater than everybody, and no one can take them out of my father's hand. And he and I are one. So his hand and my hand are the same hand, is what he's saying. It might seem like I'm not a powerful man here on earth. Jesus was meek, and he was mild, and he was not, you know, uh, asserting himself. He might not look like the per kind, kind of person who could really protect the sheep from wolves and such. He was lamb-like himself. He seemed holy and harmless and separate from sinners. How could he protect the sheep? How could he guarantee that no one could snatch them out of his hand? Well, he says, because it's my father, really, who's got them in his hand. Being in my hand is the same as being in my father's hand. I may not look impressive, but my father is greater than everything. And it's his hand that they are in. They are his people. They're in his hand. And the, the reference to being in the hand of the shepherd is an is a idiom that is found in Scripture elsewhere. It's kind of a common idiom. In fact, there is a, a song that has sometimes been sung. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our God, our Maker. Do you remember that old worship song? It was very popular at one time. It's from Psalm 95, verses 6 and 7. Psalm 95, 6 and 7. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our God, our Maker. For He is our God. And we are the people of His pasture and the sheep of His hand. Now, the sheep of His hand... Again, is the idea that the shepherd's hand, he's got his hand on his sheep. His sheep are in his hand. They're in his control. They're under his protection. And so Jesus says, my sheep are in my hand. And my hand is no different than the father's hand. No one can snatch them from that. Now, several things, several words in this section, especially verses 28 and 29, seems serviceable to make Calvinistic points, especially of the, the perseverance of the saints, the idea that if you're really a Christian, you'll never fall away, which is a very nice doctrine and uh, one that would be very nice to believe if you could be sure that you were one of the ones it's talking about. You see, the problem with the doctrine that if you're really a Christian, you'll never fall away is that if you end up falling away, you never were a Christian. And since there are many people who seem to be Christians for years and years and have a very convincing testimony. But then they do fall away. According to this doctrine, they never were Christians, which is scary because it means that all those years that they and everybody else believed they were Christians, all those years when they had convincing assurances that they were Christians, according to this doctrine, since they eventually fell away, they weren't Christians even then because they would have persevered. This, of course, means that if you believe that doctrine, you could never be sure that you're really a Christian until you can be sure that you won't fall away, since some people do. I mean, that's an observable fact, not a doctrine. You don't have to read the Bible, although you can read about it in the Bible. In the Bible, some people fall away, and it's predicted that others will fall away. Some will depart from the faith, Paul said. But if the doctrine is true, that true Christians never fall away, that means that the many who do that we have observed and that are predicted to, they never really were Christians at all. And some of them looked like Christians so convincingly that they themselves thought they were Christians and had, as near as can be ascertained, convincing assurances of being Christians, but then it turned out they weren't. And since some do fall away, it means that maybe you could too. And if you did, that would only mean that you weren't a Christian earlier. So that doctrine is scary, really. If you could know for a fact that you're one of the elect, then it's a reassuring, oh, the elect could never fall away. But how do you know if you're elect? Well, the only sure way of knowing is that you don't fall away. You see, according to this, uh, these teachers, you can have all the convincing proofs of being a Christian, but the final proof is that you persevere to the end. And you can think you have the Holy Spirit. You can think your sins are forgiven. You can think you're a true believer. You can think that you love the brethren. You can think that you're obedient to Christ and he's your Lord. You can think all those things, but if the day comes when those aren't true anymore, then you, they weren't ever true. And if you've been around as long as I have, or even much shorter time than I have, 
you have observed people who had those convincing evidences of being Christians, and they don't have those evidences anymore because they're not locked with Jesus anymore. And therefore, according to this doctrine, they weren't Christians no matter how much they thought they were. And you have to ask the Calvinists, then how do you know you are a real Christian? Oh, well, we can know that we are. Well, how can you know? Well, we, we know because we have the Holy Spirit. Well, these people would have said they had the Holy Spirit. How do you know that they weren't as convinced as you are convinced? Well, that's different because it's us. We're different. How so? Well, we know. We have assurance. Well, these people had assurance. What really makes the difference? The only thing that makes a difference between the person who really is saved and isn't, in their mind, is that one so far has persevered and the other one has not. But, of course, the one who has persevered so far, who can predict? Maybe they will not persevere to the end. And if they don't, it'll simply mean not that the doctrine is false, but that they were false. They only thought they were true. So, what does this mean? It means you can have no actual assurance of salvation if this doctrine is true. If the doctrine is true that a true Christian can never fall away, then until you die faithful and did not fall away. You can't really know whether you're really a Christian. You can think so, hope so, be fairly convinced, but never have total assurance. Whereas the Bible says we can have assurance. John said, these things I've written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. I know that I have eternal life. Why? Because I believe in Christ. There's assurance of that. Do I know that I will believe in him till I die? I certainly am convinced that I will. But Paul said, if anyone thinks he stands... Let him take heed lest he fall. And there's, don't be too cocky about it. Because if you think you can't fall, you may be surprised. Once you start being too sure of yourself. But I do believe that as long as I am not sure of myself, but I'm sure of Christ, as long as I'm trusting Christ, I'm safe. No one can pluck me out of his hand. No one can pluck me out of the Father's hand. I am secure there. Now, I can be a fool and stop being one of his sheep, in which case I won't be in his hand anymore. His sheep are in his hand. How do I stop being a sheep? Well, what's he say? The description of a sheep. My sheep hear my voice. They follow me. So as long as I'm hearing his voice and following him, doesn't that qualify me as a sheep? What if the time comes when I'm not listening to him anymore and not following him? Well, that means I'm not a sheep anymore. Well, who is in his hand? His sheep are in his hand. No one can steal them from him. But it is obvious that some people who are his sheep can wander off. This is true in the Old Testament, certainly, and the New as well. In Isaiah 53, 6, it says, All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. Isaiah is talking about the apostate Israel, the apostate Judah. They were God's sheep, and they've gone astray. Now, were they all rescued? Some of them were. Some of them weren't. Is it possible to go astray and stay, and stay astray even when you're one of God's sheep? It is, but you cease to be his sheep. Jesus defines being a sheep not by what race you are of. Of course, you can't stop being Jewish. You can't stop being a Gentile. You can't change that. If you were saved by being a Jew or a Gentile, then you, you know, that couldn't change. If you're saved by being circumcised, well, once you've done that, that can't change. But those aren't the things that save you. What qualifies you as one of the sheep is that you hear him, you listen to him, you follow him. So the issue is, are you following him? If so, then you're his sheep. What if the day comes that you decide not to follow him? Well, you won't be a sheep anymore. What, then did someone pluck you out of his hand? Nobody plucked you out of his hand. As long as you're determined to follow him, as long as he's your Lord... As long as he is your shepherd, as long as you're his sheep, you're safe. You decide to reinvent yourself as an unbeliever, redefine yourself as not a sheep, well then, there's no guarantees for you. And that's why the Bible gives so many warnings to people who are Christians about the dangers of falling away. No one can pull you away from Christ, but you can allow yourself to leave him if you are fool enough. <laughs> 